So we're going to be going over assessing the situation before you go out tonight, or not tonight, but in general, uh, before you go out. And we're going to go over night first, and we're going to go over daytime after that. There are three things you need to pay attention to when you are assessing your environment that you're about to get yourself into. You're going to rate them, and these three things are the volume of the place you're going to. If you don't know the answer to this, um, then you're going to have to just kind of guess on this one. If it's a, if it's a bar, I would, ex I would expect it to be sort of a, if you had to do this, all the stuff sort of 1 through 10, I would guess that the volume for a typical bar is at around 7. The vo volume for, a, what's that? Noise. Noise. Mm -hmm. That's talking, that's music, that's whatever, right? Um, volume for a typical club is like a 9. It's like really, really loud. And for like a coffee shop or a lounge, it's typically like a 4 or 5. Guys who don't like bars or clubs are typically annoyed most by this, the volume. The volume and then the other thing, which is the second one, which is how crowded it is. Crowd. The amount of people that are there. This is going to drastically shift how you, uh, how you approach going out or getting ready to go out and assessing your situation for the night. And the last thing is going to be lights. Now, this doesn't mean necessarily that are, the lights are bright or dim. It means more so that there's lots of stimul visual stimulation going on. Like if there's a lot of stuff flashing, if they have like blinking lights and the dance floor and crap like that, um, then you have to have a completely different energy level going in. So if it was like zero volume, no one's there, and there are lots of lights, it would, you know, you'd obviously get ready in a different way than you would if it was really loud, a huge crowd, and then the lights were on because you'll be able to see everybody. Again, remember that whenever you're in a low-lit environment, people think that they can hide more. So everyone who's there puts on another face and puts on another personality. And you have to be able to be comfortable with that and not try to go into some deep like, emotional conversation. I'll grab my water and my Sharpie and your notebook. OK, so here's what we're going to do. You're going to assess by thinking about these three different qualities, and you're going to go 1 through 10. Uh, at the end of it. So you don't have to do each one, one through ten, but if it's the volumes, it's going to be really loud. Let's say it's a loud environment. Um, there's a lot of people, and, uh, but there aren't, the, like, you know, it's kind of dim, but there aren't like blinking lights everywhere, right? I'd probably say then that you're looking at around a level eight. So let's say it's, this is a volume of eight, crowd of eight, and lights of three, right? So not very much visual stimulation. Then your total is going to be eight. Roughly, eight or seven. You can't just average these all together, by the way, and you'll get a number. That's um, this is not the average for these three numbers. I don't want to. I don't want to put that out there. I could make this five. Now it might be the average, seven or so. Yeah, I know. Jade is all my math, my math guy. So you're gonna come up with the number. Let's say that the volume is uh, six, the crowd is a four, and the lights are a four, right? then that's probably going to be about a five. This is kind of making sense? Whenever you get the number, the readout for the place you're going to, I'm going to tell you how to pump yourself up. One, by the way, is going to be very, very, very low key. So if you get like a, a one down here where all this is one or something zero or whatever, it's super low key. And 10 is extremely, extremely st stimulating, like stuff going on all the time everywhere, stuff happening, it's just constantly being distra distractions all over the place. Now what you're going to do is you're going to match your energy level to the energy level of the place you're going to before you get there. Before you get there. If you don't do this before you go, you're going to show up at a different energy level almost always and you're going to be either too eager and too pumped up and you're going to look like a freak or you're going to show up looking like a total downer and chilled out. And you don't want that either. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you sort of a couple different tools that I use. Uh, to sort of get myself going. This is across the board, whether I'm going out during the daytime or nighttime period, it won't really matter. During the daytime, typically, you're not going to have these like, light issues. There's not going to be a whole lot of light stimulation. There may be crowds, and there may be volume, but usually not this. So usually, it's a lower key environment. So I'm going to talk first about the thing that probably helps people the most to get ready, and that is music. Music is typically, will, will typically get you in a mood for something. That's why we listen to it in the first place. So you have to have three different major playlists or albums that you listen to that get you in three different moods. If you listen to the wrong one, you'll screw yourself. 
And it may sound really silly, but if you listen to the wrong album while you're going out, you'll get there and you'll be in the mood of what brought you there while you're listening to it. And it'll show up and you won't be ready to talk to anybody or you know, you'll be too pumped up or whatever it is and people will be kind of thrown off by you. So you need three different types of playlists. Your first one, I'm, I'm going to go up here. Your first one's going to be sort of, uh, let's see, what is it, one to two? Yeah. If it's like a one or two uh, level for down here, you're going to have your, you know, just your chill playlist. Something that's comfortable, you listen to probably whenever you're at your house, hanging out. You don't want to get too pumped up. If you do, then you'll be freaked out when you get there. People will be asking you for drugs. <laughs> I, um, when I first started uh, doing this, um, I have a lot of stories that start out like that, but when I first started um, really approaching a whole bunch and going to bars a whole bunch and trying to figure this stuff out, I had uh, this weird association with being successful and being really uh, energetic. And I would go out to places and I'd be super pumped up. And I was like, yeah, I was talking really fast. And I stopped one day because um, I went out one night and I was talking to a bunch of people and I'm being really friendly. And then I walk into the bathroom and some guy follows me in the bathroom and, uh, and he goes, hey, I was like, hey, there's a guy talking to me in the bathroom. I'm like, hey, that's not normal. Girls do that all the time. Guys do not talk in the bathroom. It's not like you don't have conversations. And he's like, so can I, uh, can I get some Coke? And I was like, what? Like Coca-Cola? He's like, no, you know, blow, man. Come on, can I get some blow? And I was like, I'm sorry, I don't have any. I'm not, and I'm not doing Coke. And he's like, and he didn't believe me. He's like, yeah, right, man. Come on, just, just be nice. Just give me some. And he's trying to get some Coke out of me. And it was just embarrassing for me. So I was like, I'm doing something wrong if people think that I'm on coke. <laughs> you know, so I had to like calm myself down and slow myself down. And I had to do that by pre preparing myself before I went there. Um, I didn't realize that I was super high energy. I was just, I'm extroverted. As I talk more and people are positively responding to me, I start to get more energetic and start to talk faster and start to get louder. And, and people would just thought that I was on drugs. Uh, so you got to be careful with that. Um, so. Let's start one and two here. It's like your chill list. If it's between three and let me write down three and seven, this is where most things are gonna fall. You're gonna have okay. This is gonna be funny, but you're gonna have what's called your hot shit playlist. This is something typically an album of something that makes you feel like you're the shit. Not something that gets you pumped up. Something that makes you feel like you're the shit. I'll tell you mine. Mine is. The uh, album Sticky Fingers by the Rolling Stones. And typically half that album. The other half I don't listen to. I'm going out to some place and I want to feel like hot shit because it's all bummer music. You need to, f to identify these albums or these playlists and create them before you go out. And when you assess it, you have to listen to that as you're getting ready to go. This is really crucial. It may not seem like it's that important, but it's really, really important. If you try, if you try this once and if it doesn't work, then never do it again. How that? It will work though. Last is your eight to ten, and that is uh, uh, your high energy playlist. This is stuff that just gets you pumped. Doesn't make you feel awesome. Nothing like that. Just makes you really excited. Now, this isn't necessarily music that you like. Uh, a lot of guys don't like to listen to music that gets them super pumped up. But if you're going to a place, you're using this as a tool. And let me tell you what happens if you do this incorrectly. If you listen to your hot shit playlist and you walk into a place and you mis uh, misread it and it's a super high energy place, you're going to walk in expecting to be looked at. When you listen to this, you're expecting to get attention. But if you walk into a place that's extremely crowded, there's a lot of stimulation and the volume is really high, you're going to blend right into the crowd as soon as you walk in, no matter how, what you look like. You could be you know, Santa Claus uniform, or outfit uniform. <laughs> they all have to have, wear the same uniform. Uh, Santa Claus outfit and no one will really notice you because there's just so much stuff going on all the time that you're going to be part of the group. So you have to listen to something that's going to make you feel like you're comfortable being part of a large group of people and blending into the group instead of standing out so much. Once you get in, you can stand out if you want to, but having this super high energy thing, if you come in expecting to be having one pay attention to you because you're listening to this one, or you're pumping yourself up by like, listening to your hot shit playlist or your, or your album, you're going to show up and you're going to be um, super let down. You're going to feel rejected as soon as you walk in the door. And that's going to show on your face because no one's going to be looking at you. No one will, period. Because everyone's out jumping up and down and going crazy all the time. 
So you have to be comfortable with blending into the crowd and then once you get in, changing. Um, I have this uh, analogy that I typically use, which is um, what's the best way to change the direction of a car? If there's a car driving on, down the street and you want it to go left, what's the best way to make it go left? Well, some people have the approach of driving another car into it, sideways. Wham! That'll make it go left, but it causes a lot of damage. The best way to make a car go left is to get in it and then tell the driver to turn. Or to drive alongside it and then start to turn with the car. Now, what I mean by that is that once you integrate yourself into the environment, then you can make shift happen and make change happen and make attraction happen. But if you show up and you're not integrating yourself in the first place, you can't make anything happen inside the, inside the room. You won't be able to run the room. You have to be able to, to fit into the group that you're getting into, and all of us can fit into any situation. We just need to prepare ourselves before we get there. Uh, this is something that I used to do all the time uh, when I would go out. and I would sit, I would have like a group of my friends, and we would sit there and we'd specifically listen to a specific playlist for a specific place that we're going to. And if we were drinking, we'd drink a little bit before we go. Whatever it is, we had a specific ritual. If we were going to a, a, like a really loud club or something, it would all be pumped up stuff the whole way. We'd be talking to everybody that we, were, that we ran into the whole way we were there, just having a great time. And we got in that mood of just having a good time, and that's it. If we were going to a place that was not so loud, it was more like a regular bar or something, we wanted to stand out. So whenever we went, uh, when we listened to, to this sort of music, we would be uh, less likely to be approaching everybody along the way, more likely to be looking at people and smiling and then continuing. Right? We're not trying to engage everybody. We're trying to draw people to us and get used to that. Because when you get to the bar, that's what you're going to be doing. You're going to be looking at people and drawing them to you more likely than you're going to be approaching them. Right? Um, I'm going to tell you a little more about that later on. So let's talk a little bit about going to a, par going to a bar versus going to a party and like at nighttime versus daytime, going on a date and all that stuff and how to prepare yourself for all these different situations. Going to a bar is all about distracting yourself. Because we all know why you're going to a bar. It's to meet chicks. You can drink at your house by yourself. You're not going to drink. So there's that reality looming over you that you're going to this bar to meet girls. But you cannot think about that. If you think about that the whole way you go, you'll be investing in that concept the entire way. Every step of the process, you'll be investing in meeting women. And when you get there, you'll need to meet women, and you'll be outcome dependent, and it won't work. It's kind of a catch-22. It sucks, but that's just kind of how it is. So instead, going to a bar is all about distracting yourself with other stuff. Again, I'll let me bring this back, actually. If it's a bar that's really chill, bless you. If the bar that's really chill, you're going to be distracting yourself in a way that's more relaxed, meaning you're going to be having a conversation with one or two people along the way. Uh, you're going to be listening to music that's just relaxing. You're going to be thinking about stuff that has nothing to do with the bar you're going to. You're making phone calls to people that you know and just talking to them while you're on your way. And just relaxing, normal kind of chill out conversation. If you're going to a bar from the 3 to 7 range, it's a little bit more high energy or that changes the energy over, over the course of the night drastically. Then instead of calling someone who is like you want to connect with or talk to, you might want to call somebody who is silly, one of your friends that always makes a joke, who laughs, who you can be kind of a dude with, right? And that's it. You want to distract yourself from the fact that you're going to this bar to meet chicks. Because when you show up there, as soon as you walk in, if what you do is look around for girls to approach, it's not going to work. It will not work. Guys who go to bars to meet girls, do not meet girls. We're all doing that, of course, but we need to distract ourselves. We need what's called plausible deniability for a bar. Plausible deniability when you're going out at nighttime to a bar or some kind of environment like that. And then, of course, if you're going to a high energy place, you're going to be distracting yourself in a really high energy way. Lots and lots of action constantly around you, so you get in that state. And you're looking at lots of different things. You're not sitting down doing a crossword puzzle. You know? Instead, you're talking to everybody you possibly can run into. You're going, woo! You're going out with friends. You know, you're high-fiving people you don't know. You're getting your, your state boosted up. So you have to distract yourself. You have to, again, sort of create a belief system that you are going to this bar to have a good time. And that's it. That's the only reason why you're going to the bar. Not even to talk to people. You're just going to have a good time. If you think any other reason than that, you're going to crash and burn. I will guarantee you that. If you, can, uh, if you have the ability to show up there thinking that you're going to a bar to meet women, but as soon as you, right before you walk in the door, you show up and you change it, you're fine. It's fine. And most guys can't do that. I'm one of those guys. I can't do that. So you don't want to be thinking about meeting girls. Now, this is funny because um, 
it's kind of like, there's not really any how-to on this except to distract yourself. I've tried a thousand different ways of doing this, and I can't think of anything that works better than just doing something else or talking to somebody else or distracting yourself uh, verbally. I had, um, there's also another uh, place that this kind of comes into play where you distract yourself, and that is whenever you meet somebody uh, that you're really, really attracted to, and you get a phone number, and you want to talk to them, and you leave, and you can't stop thinking about them. If you don't stop and, you dist and distract yourself from thinking about them, you'll create a, what's called an imaginary relationship, meaning you'll start to think about them when they're not there, and you'll, your subconscious mind doesn't know the difference between an imagined memory or imagined thing and an actual memory that happened. So your subconscious mind starts to build a relationship with this person, and that's what controls your emotions. So you start to feel like you've been with this person for a really long time, and it'll freak you out. And it ruins a lot of relationships early on. Really, really attractive women, especially uh, if you guys are in the front row, they talking about the explorers. If you get, um, we went over archetypes for women and how to type women and what to say to them when you type them but, um, yesterday. But women who are super uh, sort of aloof and don't want any, uh, to be nailed down to anything, to have any kind of uh, obligations or they, they want more options. If you uh, sort of show up and uh, sort of have this idea that, that you're going to be thinking about them over and over and over again as you, after you get their numbers, which most guys do because they're really attractive and you want to talk to them, um, they feel like they have fewer options and they get freaked out and they leave. So you can't do that. Um, anyway, if you guys got to look at those, uh, the backs of the people in the front row, the backs of their, their books, and you saw those different archetypes that I was going over, um, with the quadrants on one, and then you had the different archetypes, the explorer, the princess, the supporter, and uh, the romantic. <laughs> Kelsey's romantic, that's why she's, she's making funny faces at me. Um, then you want to basically shift how you approach these different women and how you, uh, how you attract them based on what they need from you. So that's for going to a bar. You want to definitely distract yourself because there's not really any other way to do it. The next thing you're going to do is, uh, we're going to talk about is going to a party. Before you go to a party, there is um, something that you, will, that you can do that will set you apart from everyone else at the party and automatically integrate you as one of the hosts in the party. And when you are a host at a party, uh, everyone wants to meet you, everyone wants to talk to you. It's easy to meet people and, uh, because you're throwing a party, so you're supposed to be going and talking to people. You can take yourself in a party that you're putting on and ask, you know, if, I, if I had put you in a party at your house that you were putting on and I said, go talk to everyone here. You'd have absolutely no problem doing that. You'd be like, hey, how you doing? This is my house, so I just wanted to invite you to my party. Right? Fine. But if I took you, same group of people, different place, not your house, someone else is hosting the party, but they're not even there, and I said, go talk to everyone here, it's going to suck. Because you're not going to have a reason, right? You're not going to have that one, oh, this is my house, that's why I'm doing this. It's just a belief system. I'm a host, so I have to go do this. Right? So I suggest that instead of showing up and trying to start from scratch, that you make yourself one of the hosts. And the way that you do that is, Two things. Come bearing gifts. Always bring something to the party. If you can bring beer, even if it's a six pack and there's a thousand people, just bring a six pack and give it to the host of the party. And give it to the host, not anybody else. Like, hey, I brought you some beer or whatever, right? This is crucial. It may seem kind of simple, but it's really, really important. Do you have time as well? Are you looking at it? Okay. Um, Next is offer to help if they need anything. They're never going to say yes, almost never, but always offer to. As soon as you do this and you come bearing gifts and then you offer to help, the host considers you another host and you can go around and say, hey, you having a good time? Awesome. Let me know if you need anything at all. You can do that in the party, even though it's not your party. And the host sort of gives you permission to do that. Even if they say, I don't need any help, thank you very much. You're like, okay, cool. Well, let me know if you do. And you still have the ability to do that. Because at that point, you are now on the host's side. Because there is the host and people cleaning up after the party and people putting on the party and everybody else. And you don't want to be everybody else. You want to be part of the crew that is responsible for this. If you go to a party and, again, you're just a patron, it's fine. You can do that. But it's always best to make yourself aligned with either side so you have a choice. That's really crucial. Uh, next, let's talk about going on a date. I just want to touch on one, some, one thing specifically. Um, and this is going on a date specifically at nighttime uh, until we get to the bottom. If you get a lot of dates with women or get a lot of numbers and start meeting up with women, you're going to find that probably about 3 out of 10 across the board of the girls that you uh, get dates with flake. Just because that's what happens. It's not because of you. It's just because that's what happens. 
there are different types of girls, and different kinds of, kinds of girls feel really hard, uh, have a really hard time being committed to certain specific things. So you can't blame yourself or them for it. It's just how it's going to be. Right? Prepare for that now. If you have something like 80% that are flaking, then you're doing something wrong. If you're doing everything right, still about 30% of the girls will just not be there. They may not even call. They may just not show up. You know? And they may never answer any texts or calls ever again. You've got to be OK with that now. It's, not, it's nothing to do with you. It's just kind of how it is. Right? But the way you handle the flake will de uh, determine whether or not you actually hang out with that girl later. Even though a girl flakes on you once, that does not mean that she's not interested and doesn't want to hang out with you again. It typically means that she doesn't want to go uh, get committed too fast. Or she's dating someone else, or who knows. It doesn't really matter. But it's just not going to work that, that specific time. So there are a couple of rules that you need to follow for handling flakes. The first is um, you never want to blame her. A lot of guys do this. They start to get angry at her because she didn't show up. Because it hurts whenever you, when you're sitting there waiting and you're expecting something to happen and no one shows up and you feel rejected. Another tendency is to get back at the girl by like writing her an angry text message like, well, I waited for you and you didn't show up, so, you know, so never do that again to me or I don't need this kind of stuff in my life or whatever. It's like some reaction, complete reaction to being rejected or feeling like you just got flaked on. I'm going to tell you now how to handle flakes every time. <laughs> this is really, really great. Typically what I do is I will, if, okay, if you, say you're showing up for a date at a place you've never been to before. If you've never been there, you want to show up early and then leave before the date starts. So I would show up early, maybe 15, 20 minutes early. Walk in. If it's a bar, meet the bartender. If it's a uh, restaurant, meet the hostess or meet the waiter, waiters, whoever you need to talk to. If you have a reservation here a little bit later on, I'm just going to swing by and talk to you, whatever. And then leave again. And go somewhere nearby, but not there. And wait for a phone call. This is important. Uh, if you're meeting a girl and you don't want to buy her a bunch of drinks, but you want to meet her out, um, get there ahead of time and buy yourself a drink and sit there and start drinking. If you don't, and you're no, you don't have a drink when she walks in, you're immediately going to have to start buying her stuff. I'm not saying you should do that to save money. I'm saying you should do that because you don't want to trade money for her time ever. You want to buy her a drink after you've gone to rapport with her, and there's a reason for you to do that. So um, showing up late, sort of like showing up late in their eyes is what you want to do. Like, oh, OK, I'm, yeah, I'm right around the corner. I'll be right there, you know, even, if, even if you've been there early and it doesn't really matter. Um, also, make other plans. <laughs> if you have a, any kind of thought in your mind that maybe someone is going to flake on you, make other plans for that night uh, to go out to some other place, maybe even double book. So it doesn't have to be with another girl or anything, but make it with, you know, if your friends are going to be around or something, be like, hey, I'm going to call you. At around, I'll probably call you around 8 uh, and see if you want to go to this bar. I'm going to be around this area to go to this bar. And they're like, okay. Just set it up ahead of time. So if something goes wrong and she does flake, it's okay. You won't take it personally because you've got something else to do that night. It's not a big deal. I had to train myself so hard to not be pissed off whenever women didn't show up for dates. Because in the beginning, it was so hard for me to get a date in the first place. And then I'd show up and I thought all the work was done and it just wasn't. I'd get there and they wouldn't show up or, or they'd be really late or something or they'd reschedule last minute. Yeah, it's, it's crappy. If it was a business, uh, if, if it was a business partner or someone that you were in business with that was doing that, you'd probably not want to work with them. But this is not a business partnership. You know? Don't think that it is. A lot of men treat dates like they're business partnerships. They're not. So um, if she does flake, you want to then leave the ball in her court. So I'll give you sort of a, a thing you can say that will help you out with this. Uh, if if um, you go to a place and then you leave early, and then you know, before it's time for you guys to meet, and you're around the corner or something, and she texts you like five minutes before, you, she knows that you're already there, of course. She's got to know that you're there. She texts you five minutes before and says, I'm not going to make it. Um, then your response back, or she calls you, your response back, she'd be like, OK, well, no worries. Not, not a big deal. I'm actually running late myself, so I'm just going to go. I have other plans tonight anyway, so I'm just going to go over here. Just let me know when you want to hang out again. That's it. Le completely leave it in her court. Don't keep pushing it. You'll ruin it if you keep pushing it. So. Now, if you do, um, anytime you meet a girl in a certain scenario, you want to meet her up the second time on a date, so sort of like a date scenario. Now, I keep saying date, though I never use that word when I'm talking to women, ever. Uh, I never go on dates. I just hang out. That's what I do. I suggest you adopt that, too. Dates have a huge connotation associated with them. It means you're going to go to a restaurant, you're going to eat dinner, you're going to be sitting across from each other, staring at each other, trying to force yourselves to have conversation. It's going to be like, the whole thing is like, am I going to sleep with this guy or not? And that's the decision she has to make the entire time she's there. 
You know, and as soon as you push forward, she's going to be weighing everything on, on your advances. She'll be more resistant typically to you because whenever you are, um, whenever you make an advance and you are uh, sort of being positive with her, like, oh, this is really great. Oh, we have a lot in common. We have a lot in common. She's going to hear, we have a lot in common, so we should sleep together. And she's going to have to say, no, no, no. Or she'll be resistant. No, no, that's not what that means. And she'll be a lot more resistant to your rapport, a lot more resistant to your attraction and to your uh, body language, everything. And she'll be resistant to because of that. So instead, don't put the frame of we're going on a date. Don't do that unless you're in a relationship. You can go on a date with someone you're in a relationship with. Don't go on a date with someone you're not in a relationship with. So instead, just hang out with them, right? So let's say that you met them one night and you're going to hang out with them another, or another, another time. Uh, open your, uh, to the next page, open your workbooks to the next page uh, after the uh, page you just wrote on a minute ago. Should be a date matrix, like uh, two crosses like this, two lines, a cross, Jesus. That's going to be really weird to people who don't see you on camera, by the way. I'm going to point, point off camera and say Jesus. And I keep doing that. Isn't that right, Jesus? So um, you'll see here, here's what I want you to do. This is called the date matrix. The date matrix basically logs two things. It logs what time of day, day or night, that you met this person, and whether or not you met them in an environment that was with lots of people or with very few people or alone. Right? If you meet her with a lot of people and uh, at nighttime, then you're going to do the opposite the next time you see her. There's a specific reason why this is. So you can use this as a reference anytime you want to. If you are like, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to hang out with a girl, what should I do? Come back to this, look at it, and go, okay, well, I met her, she, um, I was by myself, or she was by herself, and it was during the daytime. I'm going to invite her out to meet a bunch of my friends at nighttime. That's what you're going to do. Always do the opposite. There's a reason why this is the case. Whenever you meet someone, they have a series of uh, environments that they need to see you in before they feel comfortable with you. Uh, most of those uh, environment, environmental uh, um, elements have to sort of revolve around whether or not it was daytime or nighttime, because again, that's a very completely different environment for them. And the other is whether or not it was a social or personal environment. If you give someone the opposite of what you, they met you in, then they'll have an extremely well-rounded view of who you are. Uh, you'll be able to go into rapport easier. They'll typically be more comfortable being sexual with you. Uh, it just makes things a lot easier. They'll feel like they've known you for a lot longer period of time, uh, even though they've only been hung out with you one time so far. If you can do this in one night, say that, say that uh, you're going to hang out with someone you met online. So it's the first time you're hanging out with them. Try this. Try meeting up with them during the daytime right before dusk by yourself and hang out with them. And then it'll get dark. And when it gets dark, go to a place that's social. Hang, go to meet up with your friends. You'll cover both these immediately. And you'll have an extremely well-rounded view of who you are. Uh, this is, by the way, this is called a time warp. A time warp you can use, uh, it basically allows someone to feel like they've been with you a lot longer than they have. Anytime you use something like this. Another way you can do it is to change venues often. Don't go like once every five minutes, but um, don't spend more than an hour, an hour and a half in one place. Meaning a park is a venue. That's one place. So if you're like walking to the park, that's one thing. Getting coffee is another one. Going to a bar is another one. Going to a club is another one. Or going to another bar is another one. As long as it's a drastically different place. Going to eat dinner or something, that's another one. So we tend to create memories based on uh, events, not based on time. Meaning I can sit in a room with you for uh, 10 hours and not know anything about you or know who you are, uh, and I wouldn't have any memory really of being in a room with you. But if I spend 10 minutes with you doing something totally out of the ordinary, then I'm going to remember you specifically. right? So we track events, not time. Have you ever done something, like had a day that went by, and you're like, oh man, it's been such a long day. And well, it's, it's 24 hours, technically. It's not a long day. Why does it feel like a long day? It feels like a long day because lots of stuff happened to you that brought you out of your comfort zone that was new, that was different. So we track time. We say, this is, I've known this person for a long time. It doesn't mean that we've known them for a lot of years. It means we've gone through a lot with this person. And whenever we are uh, going on a, sort of hanging out with a girl, being sort of on a date with a girl, you want to create that sense of, oh, I've been with this person for a long time. I've known them for a long time. Right? Especially if uh, a girl's a tr more traditional. She needs to sort of be around you for a lot longer. A lot of guys will uh, sort of meet women and they feel like they need to sleep with them immediately. And I just, I, it's just such a misnomer. It's ridiculous. The guys who are really, really good at attracting and meeting women, they're not in a huge hurry. 
You know, if you know what you're doing, why would you be in a huge hurry? If you have lots of options, you wouldn't need to sleep with a girl that night. You know? So it kind of defeats the purpose of creating all this pre-selection attraction and making you think that lots of, guys, lots of other uh, girls want to be with you, you know, and that a lot of guys respect you if all of a sudden you need to sleep with her and you need to get laid. That doesn't, that's incongruent. You know? So a lot of guys start out with this and they, they freak themselves out because they, they need this and they make it happen. They need to make it happen that night. Um, going out uh, to a lounge specifically, like someplace a little bit more low key. Show up early, if you're going on a date, show up early and then uh, meet the bartender. And then when she gets there, introduce her to the bartender by name. This is really powerful. Something that's not so busy, you know. If it's a really busy place, you don't want to meet the bartender because cra- they're working like crazy. Like they'll freak out if you're trying to talk to them. Like, Dude, just take your drink and leave, you know. <laughs> they don't want to talk to you. Also, um, a lot of guys don't do this. It's just kind of common knowledge, but the first drink you get, tip well. Especially tip well before this girl shows up because the bartender is going to know that you tip well and then respect you and like talk you up in front of the girl and that's the bartender. The bartender is, has the highest value in the entire place that you're going to. So if it's a lounge, like some, some kind of a loungy bar. And tipping well is like, if you get a beer poured and you tip a buck, that's normal. Tip two bucks, it's a little bit better. Right? That's kind of cool. Right? And don't tip and then leave. Like, don't just put the money down and then walk off and, uh, so that they don't know who it is. Like, they need to see that it is where, you, where you're sitting, put it down, sit there for a minute, and just make sure you get their name. And whenever the, your date shows up, when you order them, when they, you order them a drink or they, when they order a drink, then you introduce them to the bartender. And typically what will happen is the bartender, for that one extra dollar you tip, that bartender will give you compliments, meet the person that you're with, and give them a free drink, which is worth way more than a buck. Uh, I used to be a bartender, and I, I know these rules. I'll tell you the guy who got served last is a guy doing this. Hey, hey bartender, hey. The guy got served last. I've, talk, I've walked up to guys and I've been like, hey man, you're a douchebag, and so I'm serving everyone here until I'm done with everyone else, then I'm serving you. So if you want a drink, get someone else to get it for you. And I would just be like, Look, you know, if you don't like it, you can leave, because it's my bar. You know, I didn't care. I also hated it, I really hated it when girls would like try to Hey, what's going on? Hey, so can I get a drink or something? Like trying to be like super flirty just to get a free drink? That pissed me off too. I'm like, sure you can. Do you have $7? I'm sure you can make $7 with those. (laughs) I was a pretty dickhead bartender. (laughs) If you've never worked at a restaurant or a bar, I highly suggest doing doing it for fun. Uh, And just, you know, if if you can. I mean, some guys obviously can't do that. It's like, it's going to be a huge inconvenience, but if you're like in between, you're looking for a job or something, go be like a bar back or train to be a bartender. It's one of the best things I've ever done. I, oddly enough, I um, didn't meet, I met a lot of women, but I didn't hook up with a lot of women whenever I was a bartender. I hooked up with way more women whenever I was a barista, of all things. Way, way, way more. Uh, and the reason why I think is because I wasn't going, oh, every, every girl who's attracted to me here just wants a free drink, which is what I felt when I was a bartender. You don't flirt with the barista to get free coffee. I don't know. Most people don't. I don't know. I don't. That's not why I do it. I'm kidding. Um, how are we, uh, Jay? Okay. Well, I, I heard a noise. I didn't know if that was like a church bells. It's the Jesus theme again. I keep coming back to it. May the Brad be with you. <laughs> All right. So during the daytime, sort of. Uh, uh, going out to meet women during the daytime, sort of like uh, preparing and getting ready to do that. If you're going to a park or a cafe or a bookstore or anything like that during the daytime, you almost always want to bring something with you, some reason why you're going. That can be a book, uh, typically it's a book. Your computer is fine. Your dog, if you have a dog or a pet, you can bring a dog or a, I wouldn't bring a mouse, I guess. That would be kind of silly. <laughs> a glittery cupcake mouse. Um, you know, a frisbee or, and a friend, maybe a journal. You know, you don't need to use it. You just need, it just needs to be there. You need to have some reason why you're going to this place. If you don't just go, if you, if you go to a coffee shop and you sit with your cup of coffee and you sit at a table and you just look around like this, it's going to be weird. You know, you don't want to do that. You want to have some other reason. Again, you want plausible deniability. Women need to think that you're not there to talk to chicks. Because if you have a lot of options, you're not going to go to a cafe to talk to chicks. You're not going to do that. You're going to stay at home and drink your coffee there with all your chicks. You know? Women know this. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, another thing is that if you're going to some place like a cafe where there's lots of people sitting around doing nothing, you want to take the time to like uh, ask for questions and opinions. There's lots of like opinion, um, they're called opinion openers that guys use, where they say, ask a question like, let me get your opinion on something, blah, blah, blah. The reason why this is a really popular thing is because when you have nothing to say, during the daytime specifically, at nighttime you typically don't want to do this, it doesn't work as well. But during the daytime, daytime you can. I mean, I, I've done it at nighttime before, but it's not as useful at nighttime because if you're going to a bar and you're drinking, you're talking to a bunch of people, you're not going to just walk up across the bar to a, a specific group of women who, there's women everywhere you could ask, and then ask them a question, hey, can I get your opinion on something? Unless it's like, you girls look like you can answer this question and no one else here can. Okay, well now there's a reason, right? So if that question is, you know, do these pants make my ass look fat? That's not going to be, you could ask any woman that. You know? So it has to be completely congruent. Most guys overlook all the congruent parts of uh, attraction. Congruency is a huge part of attraction, huge. Instead they look at things that they should say, do, whatever, but it all has to say the same thing. You, all have to be, you have to be sending the same message across the board with all your body language, with all your verbal language, and with everyone around who's interacting with you. Then you all need to be saying the same thing. If ever there's some incongruence where one part of your body is saying one thing, meaning that your body language is saying that you're unattractive, or you're not really used to beautiful women, and what you're saying is that you are, women will never trust you or believe you. As soon as they get that sort of instant feeling of uh, incongruence, they get turned off and they want you to leave. And they'll reject you. So, but if you're at a cafe or a bookstore or something, you're going to ask what seem to be pretty innocent questions before you start bantering. So like, uh, you know, a bookstore, common question at a bookstore is, have you read this? Or should I waste my time with it or should I just watch the movie? It's like, well, it's the dictionary, so I don't know if you should watch the movie. <laughs> also, if you're going to a uh, cafe or some place that, or a bookstore, I'd say, either way, actually, and it's super, super busy, you're not going to be able to go around and talk to everyone. Like, so if you walk into a place that's kind of more dead and you want to approach and talk to women, you can walk in and you can talk to someone immediately and uh, it won't be a big deal. You can just like, start to have conversations with everybody because everyone's kind of spread out and open. But if it's really busy, you're going to have to have specific targets because there's something called psychological space. Psychological space is our, our, what we perceive as being our personal space. And it's based on a few things, but one thing that's really huge is based on how many other people are around us. So if you're standing in a room with uh, 100 people and it's packed, your personal space is like this big. So if you take out everybody but one person, your personal space, and you're staying in the same exact spot in the same room, your personal space isn't this big anymore. It expands to fit the entire room except where that person is or except for their personal space. Right? So let's imagine that you're sitting on a bus and the whole bus is empty and someone walks in they sit next to you. And there are empty seats everywhere. That's weird. right? Now because you have psychological space working to your disadvantage in that situation, you'd have to sit somewhere else and then talk to them because it's overt otherwise. Unless you sit down and you're just like, hey, you're cute, I'm going to talk to you. And there's a reason why. So whenever you meet women during the daytime in a busy place, a busy cafe or busy bookstore, you have to have more targeted people that you're going to go talk to. You don't just talk to everybody or talk to all girls. You have to have more targets because their psychological space is smaller and you can't enter and become, be on their radar as easily, so you have to get directed. By the way, I am going to go over exactly what to do in all these different scenarios during this course, just so you know. This isn't like the part where like, I'm supposed to be explaining that. This is just how to get ready for these different things, different situations. Let me see there. Okay. All right, also, this is something to keep in mind. When you're getting ready to go out during the daytime, uh, weather is a factor. Not just rain, but I mean how cold or hot it is. Uh, I'll tell you why. People in colder weather typically feel um, less likely, they feel uh, less expecting, expecting rather, of a rapport. And it's really interesting that why this happens. Uh, most people attribute this to uh, the bundled up factor. Like we're protecting ourselves. So uh, do me a favor, everyone take, do you have something you can like, something that you're drinking or something you can hold? Let's, even if it's just your martini glass with little, I don't know why there's a martini glass with little stuff in it, but um, pick it up and put it in front of your chest like this. And when you do this, it creates an instant feeling of comfort, of safety. Now take it and put it down here, and now you feel vulnerable again. You feel that? You feel like you're exposed. Now you may not because you have an internal frame, by the way. This may not affect you at all, but most people will because they have uh, in external frames. 
So what's happening here is you're protecting a part of your chest that is very vulnerable. When you're bundled up with a lot of clothes, you feel safer. That's why some people who you know, wear jackets when they don't need to are doing so because they feel vulnerable and they feel like someone's going to attack them. But whenever you do wear a jacket, regardless of who you are, for the most part, it'll make you feel safer. Even if it's completely, unless it's a you know, uh, bulletproof vest, there really is no, uh, no reason why it should make you feel safer. It's not, it doesn't make you any safer. You're not any physically safer. But we think that because that's sort of how, how our psychology works. If we have our environment changes around us, our minds react to that environment immediately, even if it doesn't make any sense logically. So, when you go out during the daytime and it's cold, you're going to be talking to people who have jackets on and they don't expect you to go into rapport or be direct with them because they feel like they're hiding. So what do you do? Go into rapport and be direct with them. You can sort of cut through it by doing the thing they don't expect. Again, it's a pattern interrupt. We talked about that a little bit earlier. If they're expecting you to be, to be talking to everybody and to be, like, you know, be, be very friendly, you're following a pattern and you're not going to be remembered. Again, we only remember people who break our pattern. We only remember people who break our pattern, period. If you don't break the pattern, you're going to be forgotten. If you do break the pattern, you will blow someone's mind <laughs> by doing this. If you imagine there's a girl and she's bundled up and you walk up and you go, you're the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. I gotta sit down and talk to you for a minute. Well, well there's lots of things. One is that she's, she knows that you can't see your body very well. So you're basing all this on her face which is a lot more real to a woman uh, as a compliment than, oh, you have a great body, which is nice, but of course she has a great body. She knows that. You know? Every guy sees that and approaches her, but no one does when they can't see it. So you'll stand out immediately if you do that.